Hello again, this is Josh Shear, author of the book 2020, The Journal of a Man Faced with Humanity's Downfall. Today I'm going to read another selection for you. Uh, I'm going to read the chapter August. August 3rd, 2020, Boonville, Indiana. Dad finally spoke today, nothing much. He asked for a wrench as he was tightening a bolt on a cargo net for his Tacoma that he had found in the garage. Even so, it's progress, and after a week and a half of silence, any words will do. August 4th, 2020, Boonville, Indiana. I suppose everything is back to normal, or at least as close to normal as we're going to get for now. Dad came into the kitchen this morning as I was preparing breakfast and began talking as though nothing had happened. He didn't mention mom or his stint of silence. I didn't bring up either one. I considered asking dad if we should abandon the farm and set out in search of my children, or at the very least head toward Henderson in the hope of a shred of civilization, but I fear suggesting we might leave, destroy the last remnants of his sanity. I have decided for now to not mention the idea. We did discuss the patrols we've been having lately. A few days ago, I had seen a large pack of night roamers across the road and a, about a half mile into the empty, weed-strewn field. I do not know if it was an organized group or if they just happened to be in the same area, but I suggested that we keep an eye on them. My father agreed and said that if we spot them again tonight, we'll plan an assault to push them out of the area before they grow in numbers. The entire month of May, we fought those damned creatures to get them off of our small speck of land. We don't have to fight them on our own turf again. August 6, 2020, Boonville, Indiana. Last night, Dad came in from his shift early. I had barely gotten to sleep when he jostled me and motioned for me to get my hunting rifle. Without speaking, we hopped into Tacoma and drove down the driveway to the road. Turning right on Wyandotte, my father finally spoke. I've got something to show you, he stated. What? I groggily asked, yawning. I was sitting at the end of the driveway with my night vision on. Suddenly, a vehicle flew past me on Wyandotte, nearly blinding me with its lights, he commented, slowing down as we reached the bend in the road. I could see through the darkness the silhouette of smoke dancing against the moonlight. He continued, Damn thing must have been going nearly 90 miles an hour. Heard it crash shortly after it passed me, he patted my knee. Thought I might get you so we could both check it out. As we approached the ditch that runs alongside the bend in the road, I could make out what looked like a vintage Lincoln Town car. Half of the vehicle was buried into the far bank of the ditch, its rear tires still spinning slowly in the air. Smokes curled out from under the partially hidden hood. Dad swung the Tacoma around and parked it so that we faced the direction of our house. In case we need to get out of here, quick, he acknowledged, hopping out of the truck. I followed suit, chambering around in my rifle as we approached the smoldering vehicle. I could see the dark figure of a person in the driver's seat slumped against the wheel. I nodded to Dad, who slid down into the ditch and opened the passenger side door. He pointed his 9mm at the driver, who did not respond. Clear, Dad shouted to me. At that, I jumped into the ditch and with my rifle in one hand, slung the driver's door open with the other. I nudged him with the tip of the barrel. The driver groaned but did not move. Are you armed? I asked the driver. No response. I could see the flames starting to lick out from under the hood. This car was going to go any minute. I'm going to help you out of the car, understand? I need you to cooperate. If you don't, there are two guns pointed at you, and we will shoot you. The driver's chest heaved, and he lifted his hands, showing he would cooperate. I flung the rifle strap over my shoulder and hoisted the driver out. It was a man, probably in his 20s, his hair cropped short. Besides a nasty gash across his forehead, he appeared okay otherwise. I dragged him out of the ditch, and my father grabbed the man's legs, helping me lift him into the back of the truck. We need to get away from this car, I exclaimed as the flame shot higher, starting to breach the dashboard. Right, my dad yelled. We jumped in the truck and took off down the road. 
As we approached the driveway, we heard a loud explosion and saw a fireball rising in the rearview mirror. We took the man to the garage and prepared a place for him. We didn't know who he was or whether or not he was infected, so he, we locked him inside for the night. This morning, he was still on the bedding we threw down for him, but was passed out. We left some food and water for him, and we'll check on him again this afternoon. August 7th, 2020, Boonville, Indiana. Tony, the man we pulled from the car a couple nights ago, is up and speaking now. He spent another night in the garage just to be on the safe side, but Dad and I are going to let him stay in the house tonight. We questioned him this morning to figure out who the hell he actually was. Tony hails from Hatfield, just south of here. He said we were the first people he had seen in over a month. Romers killed his neighbors almost three weeks ago. He had been holed up in his house, shooting Romers as they approached, but three days ago he finally ran out of ammunition. Having nothing left but a bottle of Jack Daniels, Tony drank all morning while trying to get his car started. By the time he was able to get the engine to turn over, he had downed the entire bottle. A pack of roamers blocking the main road forced him to turn down Wyandotte. One roamer, who was perched in a tree, jumped on his car as he turned. Spooked, Tony gunned the car, which caused the roamer to flip off the hood. In his drunken stupor, though, Tony failed to slow down and slammed into the ditch. Later, I went out to Wyandotte to check his story. The rotting carcass of a roamer, his neck snapped, crumpled in a pile on the side of the road near the intersection, confirmed his explanation. If he proves himself capable, we'll eventually give Tony a weapon to help defend the property. In the meantime, we're still going to keep a close eye on him. August 10th, 2020, Boonville, Indiana. Tony, fed up with our lack of trust, volunteered to go on a patrol last night, unarmed. We didn't know if he would follow through or not, and then when he did, we doubted he would survive. He did survive, though, by hiding in one of Dad's old deer stands for most of his shift. Today, we gave him the SKS we took from the man at the IGA, the one with the banana clip that holds 30 rounds of ammunition. Looks like Tony will be hanging out with us for a while. August 15th, 2020. Boonville, Indiana. We haven't had any rain since August 2nd. Augusts are notoriously dry around here, and this summer is no different. Our meager crops that we planted back in May are all but withered. We've been eating wild blackberries and the occasional squirrel. We were eating frogs from the pond earlier, but we don't want to overhunt them. We may have to rely on their scrawny legs for sustenance in the future, as wild game is hard to come by these days. With Tony working with us, We've been able to expand our perimeter beyond the original 10 acres that Dad owns. The neighbor's house has been sitting vacant since April when they fled to town, erroneously thinking that being isolated in an emergency would be catastrophic. We assume they're dead. Acquiring that space will give us control of the side of the hill where we can plant traps for any roamers that might come from the east. The subdivision that sits behind our property has been fairly free of activity since our campaign in May, but we haven't had enough manpower to secure the area completely until now. It's littered with burned out houses that are difficult to protect without some sort of additional fencing. Our goal is to completely secure about half of that subdivision and all 10 acres of the neighbors to the east, in addition to the 15 vacant acres to the west. We have started construction on a fence to hopefully keep the roamers at bay. Scavenging through our newly acquired territory, we salvaged three generators and scores of firearms and ammunition. We have enough firepower now that we have adopted a shoot-on-site policy in regard to the roamers. We average about five kills a night. August 20th, 2020, Boonville, Indiana. Tony volunteered to go into town to get gas for the generator. We were hesitant at first, and we were going to prevent him from going. We told him he could go if he took the Dakota, knowing that it had not ran since shortly after I arrived. Tony is some sort of grease monkey, though, because a few hours later I heard the old truck sputter to life. Reluctantly, we handed over the gas cans. I decided to go with him, just in case he decided to take off and not return. 
If that was his original plan, he never showed any signs of it. Tony welcomed a partner for the trip and chatted nonchalantly the entire time. We had to find a new gas station. When Dad and I went on our last trip for gas, the fuel level in the storage tank dropped beneath the reach of the hose. The trip was uneventful. No roamers, and thankfully, no trigger-happy survivors. August 21st, 2020. Boonville, Indiana. I've grown stoic in the face of all this death. I try not to think about the fact that this spring the creatures I gunned down were humans, many with families and jobs and aspirations. It's a cold and calculated operation we've developed. We patrol in three shifts. Dad, being the oldest, takes 7.30 to 10. I take 10 to 2. And Tony takes 2 to 6. We patrol the perimeter of our compound, which is now entirely, completely fenced in. If we see a roamer within the perimeter, we shoot it dead, and at first opportunity wake the person who's supposed to take the next shift so that we can do a double patrol in case more roamers have breached the line. If multiple roamers are found inside the line, we wake both men who are in the house, and we all patrol. So far, we've been fortunate. Only one double patrol and no triple patrols. Otherwise, if we see a roamer outside the perimeter during patrol, we shoot it if we have a clear shot. If we don't have a shot, we tell the next person on patrol to be aware of the sighting. In either case, we always make a note of where the roamers are spotted so we can track how many we've seen in any given area. That way, we can reinforce the fencing at specific locations or increase our patrol of the zone. It's a pretty tightly controlled system and removes any doubt one might have about shooting other humans, even if they have been transformed somehow into a mindless animal. No amount of planning could have prepared me for what I had to do last night, though. I was on patrol in the subdivision and was about an hour into my shift. As I leaned up against the side of one of the brick houses in the area, I heard a scratching noise coming from inside the house. I thought it might have been a rat, but it would have been an awfully large rat, so I entered the house to investigate. I had my 38 drawn and cocked. As I entered the kitchen, something jumped from the top of the refrigerator, leapt onto the kitchen counter near the sink, and tried to break through the window. Instinctively, I swiveled around, and as soon as the laser sight landed on the dark mass, I fired a shot. The shadow let out a pathetic yelp and fell to the floor, squirming. I fired another shot, and the shadow fell still. Squinting in the pale moonlight to see what I shot, I remembered my flashlight and grabbed it off my belt, flicking it on. I've seen hundreds of dead bodies by now, but I almost threw up at the sight of this one. A little boy, no more than six, lay in a pool of black blood. He looked grotesque and jaundiced like all of the other roamers I've killed, but he was distinctively a little boy. His feathery hair fell haphazardly across his face. In his tiny hand, he clutched a cookie. I turned and shone my light on top of the refrigerator from where he had jumped. A broken cookie jar glinted in the yellow beam of my light, its cookies spilling out. I couldn't bear any more. I could feel tears swelling in my eyes. I hurried out of the house and continued my patrol. I didn't mention to Tony that I had killed the boy inside of the perimeter. I didn't mention him at all. August 23rd, 2020, Boonville, Indiana. The rain finally came today, a pounding, heavy rain. I still vividly see the little boy clutching the cookie in the abandoned house. The image is ingrained in my mind. I'm sick of this. I'm sick of patrols, sick of killing, sick of living like this. I just want to see my children. I'm frustrated. I can't abandon my father who will not leave his home. I also know that the world is still a very dangerous place, and attempting to travel all the way to Alabama could be disastrous. Roamers are still very much a threat in this region, and there's no way of knowing whether they line the route to Alabama or not. I try not to think of the obvious concern, which is that my children may not even be alive should I make it to the farm where my brother was supposedly headed. The rain is much needed, 
but the dull roar of it pouring from the heavens gives me a headache. That concludes the chapter August. Uh, I will be back again to read another chapter for you. Until then, this is Josh Shear, author of 2020. I hope you have a wonderful day.